Good morning, legacy viewers from a cold and wet East London this morning. But uh, my uh, interview today is with Les Jordan. He's uh, on the other side down under, so it's afternoon there in Australia. Um, Les was uh, part of the tank squadron in 1987, and he's going to give us a bit of information. Welcome, Les. Uh, welcome to Legacy. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, maybe if you just give us a bit of background, uh, where you, how you got involved in, I'm assuming you were a national serviceman, um, you'd been called up, I assume, to SSB and then gone to um, School of Armour. That's maybe. correct, yeah. So I was called up um, during my matric year in 1985, and um, I was um, called up to one SSB in Bloemfontein. So 12th of January 1986, I reported there, um, went through a selection process and got selected to junior leader course at the School of Armour. So after two weeks at SSB, got shipped off to School of Armour, where I did my basic training. And then after the basic training, went through another selection course where they basically asked us whether we wanted to do the armoured cars or to remain with tanks. So I chose the tank screen. Uh, uh, stream and um, yeah, ended up doing Chang Chang Junior Leader course, became a corporal, and was posted to E Squadron in January 1987. Now, E Squadron was the operational squadron of the School of Armour, of the tank, operational tank squadron at School of Armour. And um, yeah, um, basically, the whole of the first six months of 1987 was spent. Um, Training with the squadron. We spent a lot of time at Lohatla in the Northwestern Cape um, doing integration drills with Forsai and, and various other elements. And um, I think it was about August 1987, um, we were sent back to Bloemfontein where we did some um, cross training with our gunners and our drivers doing each other's specialities just so that our crews become all rounders. At that stage, there were already rumblings of things going on in Angola. And um, I think it was towards the end of August, beginning of September, 1987, 6-1 um, MAC had been um, deployed in Angola as well as 3-2 battalion. And there were rumors that we might be joining them. Of course, we sort of laughed that off because tanks had never been used in Angola before. Um, and then suddenly towards the, I'd say mid, September 1987, things all suddenly came to a very quick um, head, if I can put it that way, in that um, all our troops were who had been scattered all around the country doing various other tasks were suddenly all pulled back together um, into the base in Bloemfontein, and we were told that we would be going back to Loatla. The difference this time was that we had been issued brand new tanks and all new equipment. And one thing I noticed as, as being the transport NPO, I was responsible for signing for all these new vehicles, is that um, all our echelon vehicles, our supply vehicles, were all landmine crews square for. Now we had never done that before. So that kind of prickled an interest in the back of my mind in that I thought, you know, this is very strange that we're only drawing landmine resistant vehicles. Um, could it be that we're actually going north? And the story coming from our leader group was the whole time was, um, no, we're just going to go do some further training at Lohatla. So anyway, towards the end of September, we went off to Lohatla where we um, were told that we need to um, shoot in our tanks and, and make sure all the sites and everything were properly um, um, integrated and bore sighted and um, we were joined by the rest of Forsyth, which included the infantry companies, the artillery and all their support elements. And then um, at a border, uh, at an order group at, at Lohatla, um, they finally told us, listen here, this was just the assembly point, we're actually going north. And of course, my, my response to that was, aha, I knew that. <laughs> I just had that feeling. And I think a lot of the troops did as well. Okay. So, that, um, yep. Oh, sorry. No, 
Carry on. Yeah, and so um, at that point, I think the whole mood changed amongst the squadron. I mean, having spent upwards of six months training with, with the infantry and all the other elements, um, you know, we, we felt we had probably the best trained element in the whole of the South African Defence Force at the time because of the amount of time we had spent training. And in hindsight, um, we knew that they were preparing us for this, what was to come. So anyway, um, after spending about four or five days at the hotline and sorting out all our logistical issues and making sure our, all our equipment was 100% in 100% working order, we hit the road. Um, we're basically told that we had a week to get to Rundu um, on the border in Southwest Africa. So of course, the, the tanks were put on tank transporters and then covered with big tarpaulins and camo nets. And we were told that so that the um, the Russian satellites couldn't see that we had tanks moving up to the border. And yeah, the whole convoy. Um, what we did is we we split the convoy up into the different elements. So that the the tanks on the tank transporters plus all our support vehicles went off first because they figured we'd probably be the slowest element. Well, in the end, um, it turned out we were averaging about 700 kilometers a day, and we got to Rundu within, oh, must have been within five days. And um, we ended up waiting for the rest of the four side uh, battalion group to actually catch up with us. And now I'm told our convoy alone, just with our 12 tanks, two tank, tank transporters, plus various other vehicles, there were 39 vehicles in all. Um, was in excess of about two kilometers long. So I can imagine some of the other elements of Forsyth, which had far more vehicles than we did, um, the infantry companies with their rifles and things like that. So, I mean, I can just imagine this, you know, these convoys going through all the various towns um, all the way up to Rundu. It must have been a, a sight for sore eyes for all the civilians, because, it, it, I mean, just from my, my perspective as, as, as a as a corporal in the squadron, you know, seeing all this, all these vehicles was, was it was actually quite mind blowing um, to see how much equipment we actually had. Um, was, once we arrived, at, yep. Sorry, Andrew. Yeah. So, so in total, there were twelve tanks, or was it twelve vehicles with tanks on them? Um, twelve vehicles with tanks on them. Tanks on them. Okay. Plus another two tank transporters with um, armored recovery vehicles, ARVs. And I think there, there might have been a spare um, MAN tank transport as well. So in total, that was 15 big trucks. And then okay. um, with that, we had two rifles, our headquarters, actually three rifles, sorry, our headquarters rifles, and then our echelon vehicles, which, which made up about, uh, what was that, 20-odd um, square full um, logistics vehicles including water bunkers and, and fuel bunkers. And then we only had one soft skin vehicle with us, which was a Samuel 50 pantry, which had um, basically um, our canteen in it. Um, we made sure it was stocked with beer as well. Um, I don't know if that was within the regulations, but we certainly had beer in our canteen truck. And Funny enough, that vehicle went with us wherever we went throughout the whole campaign and, and didn't get a scratch on it. The only soft skin vehicle among all our vehicles in the squadron. But anyway, once we got, got to Rundu, um, we took the tanks, offloaded them off the tank transporters, and we did a little bit of training at a training ground just south of Rundu for a couple of days. And once the, um, the whole of the battle group had, had, had gathered there, we then um, one night went across the Kavango River on a on a pontoon bridge erected by the engineers, which looked like it would never take the weight of the tanks, eleven let alone um, twelve tanks plus two ARVs. But it was the strangest sensation going over that bridge because it was a pontoon bridge, basically on pontoons that floated on the river. As you drove along the bridge, there was like a ripple in it, and you sort of rode the wave across the bridge. Obviously, we only had one tank at a time on the bridge, but that was quite a, an interesting experience because once we stopped at the other side, we went into a defensive position. And I remember being clearly told we are now in Indian country and had to be on the lookout for the enemy. 
I mean, obviously, in hindsight, I now know that the enemy was a couple of hundred kilometers away, so we were in no danger whatsoever. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so once we got across the river, um, we basically spent some time just the other side of the river doing a little bit more training and, and you know, basically getting used to the conditions, the thick bush and, and practicing maneuvering with the rifles between us in that thick bush. Because at La Hatla, um, I mean, you're basically in, in the Kalahari Desert. So, sure. you know, yeah. visibility is, is very easy. And um, this was the first time we had actually got to, to work with, with the, the Forsai element in the thick bush in southern Angola. So we did that for a couple of days as well as move. Oh, because there were no roads, we were basically making the roads as we went along. So the whole battle group basically followed the tanks as the tanks bashed their way through the bush and created a road. And um, uh, very and interesting um, that, that, that was the first sorry. time that I saw the type of terrain that, that, that we had encountered there, where it was like driving on a beach. So you've got very soft white sand, but there's dense bush. So yeah. no grass, just this white sand and trees and bush everywhere. Uh, very and, unique and the, sort of terrain, but yeah. And the tanks handled that all right? Oh, no problem at all. You know, at first there was there was a bit of trepidation about you know the soft sand and how that would affect the tanks, but um, no issues at all. The only issue we had was the amount of dust that we threw up when driving through that sand with the tanks. So anybody driving behind us just got a face full of dust. And, and what's it's... also interesting is that white sand was throwing up a pitch black dust. So, you know, when the drivers and people who had been driving for a day got out of their vehicles, they were covered from top to toe in what looked like um, coal ash, you know, thick, uh, and not thick, but fine black um, dust. So it's very interesting, but uh, yeah, I mean, it took us roughly about a week to travel the, uh, I think it was about 60 odd kilometers from Rundu to Mavinga, which was the main Unita logistics base, where we gathered and, and basically, once again, did a lot of maintenance and checking on our equipment, uh, received orders, um, including um, aerial photographs of, of what our target looked like. And I must say, we were very well briefed at Mavinga. Um, our squadron commander, Major Andre Ratif, actually uh, put in a huge effort to ensure that, that the squadron was well briefed and, and we had a very clear picture of what we were up against. And um, yeah, towards, uh, I think it was about the 7th of November, um, we had our final order group at Mabinga and we were told, right, um, we're now moving up north. And um, we moved to an area, uh, must have been about, if I can remember correctly, about 40 kilometers north of Mavinga. Um, and once we got to that area, we were told that that was our staging area for, for our first attack, which would take place on the 9th of November. Yeah. And once again, once we got into this, this um, assembly area, um, received more briefings. Um, our officers spent a lot of time away from, from the squadron, you know, attending um, planning meetings and things like that. And then on the night of the 8th of November, we were basically told by Major Retief that we can each go and grab one beer from our pantry truck and um, enjoy that beer because his words were tomorrow, uh, we're going to see action for the first time. Of course, everybody was very nervous. Um, there were a lot of guys that, you know, became very quiet and introspective and others just, I, I think it was a coping mechanism just, you know, acted out of it, but yeah. I was I was involved in, in Operation Skeptic, the attack on smoke shop. And, and I know exactly what you're saying because we experienced the same. There were, there were some guys that had premonitions that they weren't going to come back and, yeah, you know, and, and uh, suddenly some guys got very religious, and uh, yeah, and I think it was it was frightening, you know, um, not knowing what uh, what you were facing. 
No, absolutely. And um, and I think the fact that we were all young national servicemen, um, you know, I mean, I was only 20 at the time. We had we had some young guys in the squadron. I mean, people like Sarrell, who, who were basically um, were in their first year of national service, um, having been allocated to our squadron because we had one or two spots in the squadron that we were short. And um, so, yeah, some very young guys in the squadron. And I think we all really felt it. And needless to say, that night, nobody got any sleep. But at about three in the morning, we were told to mount the vehicles and off we went. Um, uh, once again, I think we were very fortunate in that um, Major Retief made it a point of, of keeping us informed on the radio exactly what was happening at every stage. So he would tell us, um, you know, while we were moving, and, and bearing in mind we were moving without light, you know, fully blacked out, on night vision. You know, you just hear this roar of vehicles, but you can't see anything because of the dust and the darkness. And, um, you know, then we'd suddenly be stopped and told to switch off and you know, the major would come on the radio and say, right, the artillery are now firing in their pre, their pre plan or their pre contact um, artillery plan, soften up the target before we hit it. And, you know, then, then we'd be ordered to start up again and move on. And eventually, uh, it must have been about 5, 4.35 in the morning, you know, started becoming light. And here we're moving along slowly through the bush. By that stage, we were moving at, I think it was a hundred meter bound, simply because of, you know, that's about as far as you could see. So what we'd do is we'd bound a hundred meters, observe, and then move again. And with with the infantry rifles um, integrated between the tanks, and, and so we moved on. And it must have been at about oh, 7.38 in the morning. It's fully light, and suddenly um, we got a call on the radio saying that the squadron has to swing 90 degrees to the left, and I'll never forget this. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we were told that there was an outpost of the 16th Brigade, um, Poplar 16th Brigade, who we were about to attack, and we were told there was an outpost to our left that had been picked up by some of the 3-2 Battalion infantry on foot, and they had seen the position and basically reported back. So what they did is they tasked one of the companies from Forsyth, I think it was A Company, and us, them in their rifles and us in the tanks, with, with the 3-2 battalion company that was also with us on foot. And we did a 90-degree left turn from the rest of the battle group and started advancing in that direction. And yeah, at about 8.30, suddenly all hell broke loose. Um, I think the infantry were probably the first to open fire because we heard a lot of small arms fire. And then the next thing, one of the tanks came on the air and said, um, he sees infantry in a bunker and he'd opened fire. And it must have been about 10 minutes later, um, one of our troop commanders, Lieutenant Hein Paree, reported on the radio that he had spotted a T-55 and that he was about to fire. And that turned out to be the first South African tank on tank contact since the Second World War. Now, um, something I did at the time, um, bearing in mind I wasn't in a tank at the time, I was actually in the HQ rifle. So I had the opportunity to actually record that first battle on, on a tape recorder that I put next to the speaker for the radio. And I recorded the entire thing. And um, the other day I was actually listening to the recording and, and you know, just reminiscing about how I felt at the time. and. Funny would enough, be... um, yes, uh, go ahead, Andrew. No, I was going to say, would it be possible to get a copy of that recording? Absolutely, yes, I can. Because then I'll put that. it in on this. I'll put it in on this video. Yes, yes. I, I think um, the recording will help, will be able to give a lot of context to to what I'm talking about now. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, Funny enough, go. with that recording. Um, I recorded it on a 90-minute cassette tape. And I, I, it must have been about two years after we tried out, I gave that tape to one of my colleagues from the squadron to make a copy of it. And he lost it, disappeared. That was it. I didn't have a copy. And for, oh, it must have been a, a good 10 years after that, you know, I kept 
sort of trying to get hold of him to see if he had managed to copy it at least before he lost my original and never got hold of him again and yeah, just gave up hope. And it must have been about a year ago. I saw somebody posted something on YouTube about a recording taken in Angola. And when I opened it, it was my recording. So what I can only think had happened is one of the copies I'd made for members of the squadron had got to somebody who had kept it and put it on YouTube uh, a year ago. And so I now have a copy of my own recording again. So. Well, that's great. That's good news anyway. Absolutely. I mean, I was totally shocked. Um, you know, having not, well, over 30 years, having not heard that and to hear it, it was my recording. And funny enough, um, th there were a couple of books that came out of the modular, um, one in particular by Helmut Roma Heitman, where he actually mentions recordings of the tank squadron in the book. Now, the only recording ever made was the one I made. So. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> And this was, this was all part of Ops Modular, is that correct? Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Ops Modular, okay. yes. 
Okay. So essentially the operation had been going for about two months before that and four side was sent up to reinforce um, 6-1 and 3-2 battalion who were already involved in the operation. But anyway, with regards to the attack on 16 Brigade, I mean, obviously, I think for all of us, that was the, the baptism of fire, if I can call it that, because that was where we experienced war for the first time. And, um, you know, having basically spent the whole year preparing for that moment, um, we were quietly confident. But still, nothing prepares you for that that fear that hits you when those rounds start coming in your direction. So, yeah. But I think the squadron did extremely well. I mean, you know, every time somebody saw an enemy vehicle or an enemy tank, it was reported on the air and then immediately taken out. So, um, what? from I'm the pers- tank squad point of yeah. view, I, I think, you know, we were very efficient and disciplined and, and, and worked very well. The same couldn't have couldn't be said of some of the infantry guys with us because they really suffered some horrendous casualties. Yeah, you know, I always found our first uh, our first um, operation, which was Skeptic on, on Smoke Shell, yeah. um, at that point we were, maybe brainwashed is the right, na- uh, right word, but we felt we were invincible. Well, Absolutely, uh, we felt yeah. we were invincible. I mean, right from the moment we arrived at one site, the rattle was this was the angle like that, so nothing would ever hit it to, to just glance off. And, yeah. and in fact, even and even uh, in January, I did a, an interview with Jan Milan at the War Museum yeah. with the rattle. And you know, even then, he was saying, "Well, the, the angles are like that, so the rounds would deflect." And and I mean, when we hit the when we had contact, they were using anti-aircraft 23 mil and 14.5 mil in a ground roll. And I mean, those things just went straight through. Yeah. And, and yeah. So, so I think for us, we, we thought we were going in, yes, we knew there was always going to be the, the risk of a death or two. But to lose 13 guys in the first 10 minutes was was never yeah. part of the, the agenda. And, and, and to me, going back later and doing camps and going, I was on uh, just after modular Hooper and Packer. And yeah. although although we were really basically unscathed in that, um, going back to me was far more um, was far more apprehensive and far more fearful for it. Because we'd learned yeah. the hard yeah. way that it wasn't just going to be a, a picnic, you know. That's and, right, and, yeah. And yeah. possibly and possibly as a result of Smoke Shell, the the future generations or the future years and operations, we're possibly a, a, a bit more aware of of the possibilities. I think so. Yes. You know. So, Very so no way. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Sorry, carry on there. Was... Yeah. So anyway, so you know, as the contact oh. went on, we were fighting our way through the positions. I mean, we started hearing reports. Um, I remember when the order came for the infantry to step out um, once we were onto the objective. And I just thought to myself, you know, these guys are mad. Getting out of their rifles to go in this environment where there's just bullets and shrapnel and all kinds of things flying around, you know, I, I really thought the infantry, well, I mean, these, yeah. guys, these, these guys had, had rather large brass ones to want to get out of a vehicle in that environment. But, but anyway. But, but in hindsight, and, yeah. Sorry, in hindsight, I I felt exactly the same. I, you know, because we had been brainwashed into this um, idea that the rifle, it never made sense to me that when you hit a, a contact, you jump out of the rifle. But having yeah. seen what happened, having seen what happened, and uh, it was probably a bit of small arms fire outside the rifle was far better than being taken out by. 23 mil anti aircraft or an RPG, you know, inside the rifle. Correct, yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, you know, I must have, it must have been about uh, an hour or two into, into this whole battle that um, one of our tanks was hit by an a enemy tank in the track and it basically blew the right track um, off. And the guys didn't realize they'd been hit. They thought they'd driven over a mine or something, but the tank couldn't move. 
But anyway, once the report came back that this tank was disabled, and uh, so it was our role, my rifle's role, to take the tiffies up so that they could either fix it or tow it out. Um, bearing in mind that the whole battle had basically moved on from there, so they were in a relatively safe position. And it was while we were sort of guiding the ARV up to this disabled tank that I saw a rifle burning to the one side. And um, I later heard that that rifle had been taken out by a T-55, and, and the gunner and the driver were still inside the rifle. But um, also later during my studies and my analysis of, of that whole battle, um, it appeared to be the same tank that took out that rifle, which was a B Company rifle, had taken out our tank um, by shooting it in the track. But anyway, what we did is we took the tiffies up and, and they basically cut the damaged part of the track off and then made a shortened track. So the track sort of only went down half of the tank. So the front half of the track, um, the suspension was missing. So all they did was they connected a shortened track to the tank uh, and, and basically chucked the driver in it and the tank reversed out of the battlefield and then joined the rest of the HQ package. And we had a spare tank with us that drove with the crew jumped in that and carried on with the battle. And just out of interest, that 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 damaged tank with the half track drove with the squadron on its own power for the entire campaign until we were relieved in in December at Mavinga. I don't think the Tiffies um, for overseas viewers mechanics basically. I don't think they yeah. got credit. Enough credit for what they did. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. They were amazingly quick, efficient. They got the job done in, in minimal time, under difficult conditions. And uh, when they did a trick like that, it worked. They they knew they just knew absolutely. what they were doing. Um, absolutely. And, and and you know, I've I've often said um, the Tiffies. The, the medics back in, in bases, back in the hospitals, back at the, the HAG. Um, those guys did an amazing job and and never really got got credited for that. You know, it was either a 6 1 operation or a 4 SAR operation or a parabat operation or yeah. a 3 2 operation. But the support structure, uh, Tiffies, medics, um, helicopter pilots um, was was incredible, and and you know it just all gelled gelled together and, and really worked like a, a well oiled machine. And uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, you know it, it, it's in later the years you hear all the stories from the individuals themselves. I mean, I've been to a lot of reunions, and um, funny enough. Um, E squadron, our tank squadron, um, for many years had had a, a reunion, and and we'd invite all the guys that were involved, and, and you know the stories you'd hear from some of these these technical guys, technical service guys, the tiffies, the medics, and you think you know these are stories that need to be told because I mean what these guys did under those conditions was truly amazing. But I mean I've yes. got another story about the tiffies a bit later, so. Okay. I'll get to that, which is just another example of, of stuff they should get credit for. But anyway, yeah, so once once the crew had hopped over into the spare tank, they rejoined the rest of the squadron and carried on with the fight. And and the, the, the vehicle was basically moved back just to where um, some of our other logistics vehicles were. And yeah, it must have been... Oh, not half an hour later, we got another call on the radio about one of the troops in one of the tanks had passed out and needed medical evacuation. So we actually had a medic in our rifle. So what we did is we got hold of the medic and they basically said, you know, move up with the medic we had in our rifle, treat the guy and if necessary, bring him back to them and then they will set further. So we moved forward in the rifle to where the tanks were. Basically, this tank had stopped the fight and just stayed static while the rest moved forward. So we pulled up next to it in, a, in the rifle, and I find this guy sitting on the front latest spake of the tank 
with his overall wrapped around his waist, so basically undone down to his waist, bare chested, just sitting there. So, I mean, I asked the crew commander of the tank, you know, what the hell's going on? They said, no, the guy had basically had dysentery or something and shot himself. And there was no way they were going to allow him inside their tank the way he smelled. Um, so basically what we did is we got him out of there, um, took off his overall, so he was just in a pair of PT shorts, put him in the rifle and took him back to the medic. And it later turned out that, that the guy didn't actually have dysentery or anything. Um, the diarrhea he had was just unrelated. What had happened was he had been overcome by the fumes from the machine gun and the main gun inside the tank and it passed out. He was actually a loader in the tank. So, I mean, very physically demanding job. And obviously he was puffing and panting and, and drew in too much of the score dust and passed out. And, and just so happened to have diarrhea at the same time. So we put him in the rifle and drove back to where the medics were positioned. There was a medical post sort of, uh, I can't even remember how far it was, not too far back. And I remember as we were driving back to the medical post, just before we got to where we had to drop this guy off, um, I saw a, a, a Runkel, one of our armored ambulances, and there were a couple of medics busy putting, um, I think it was three guys into body bags. Now, clearly white South African guys. And I just remember how I felt at the time because that was the first time in my life I'd ever seen a dead person. I hadn't even seen any of the dead enemy on the battlefield up until that stage. Right. And and the first thing I saw, and I can remember clearly, one of the guys was a blonde guy. And they had, obviously, in an effort to revive him or treat him, they'd opened his shirt and his chest, his bare chest was um, visible. And I just remember seeing all these little red marks on his chest. And I later found out that these three, uh, when the order came to step out of the rifle, as they got out of a rifle, a, a mortar bomb had landed between them and killed three of them. And these were the three that were busy being inserted into body bags. And that had a profound effect on me because all of a sudden the excitement of, of being in battle suddenly, now it's not so exciting anymore, people are dying. And I think, Certainly some of the guys with me on my rifle, including the medics, you know, who also saw that just their attitude changed there and then, you know, from all this excitement and, you know, let's get in and let's do this to, well, hang on a sec, it's actually dangerous. But anyway, once we dropped the guy off, we then picked up one of, we had some spare crews in, in some of the other vehicles. Um, um, traveling with the squadron. So we picked up a guy and basically took him forward again to the tank um, to replace the guy that had now just been um, dropped off at the medic. Um, and it was at that stage, basically, we had, we had fought our way through the, the objective. So, so the, the squadron had been ordered to stop, not, not chase the enemy any further, stop there. And then the infantry would come up and clear the trenches and do what infantry do on, on these things after a major battle. And I remember while driving back, I think we were asked to go back to the medics, go pick our guy up because he was actually all right. They just gave him some tablets and put him on a drip for half an hour and he was fine. And um, while the rifle was stopped at the, at the um, medical post, I actually walked up a couple of hundred meters to where this burning rifle was, the one that I told you about that had been taken out. And, and I mean, the thing was totally on fire. And um, I remember the back door of the rifle was, had been blown open, you know, with the ammunition going off on the inside. The back door had been blown open. And I remember looking up that passageway between the engine and the side at the anti-aircraft gunner position on the rifle. And I remember just seeing into the turret, I couldn't really make out what was going on there, but I just remember seeing two um, glowing red dots through the flames and the smoke. And later on, I thought about it and I thought the only thing that could be could have been the gunners, the, the press studs on the back of his tank overall that were so glowing that's... because of the fire. And that's what I was seeing. But anyway, I walked around the rifle um, at a fair distance because ammunition was still cooking up inside it. And once I got around the front, I can remember that 20mm cannon was pointing up maximum elevation. 
And right next to it, there was a hole, literally that big, the size of a 100 millimeter tank round. And it looked to me that that round entered where the sight was on the 20 mil, just next to the, yes, the barrel. Yes. Just, the box. Yeah, yeah straight through that. So it must have gone straight through the gunners as well. But anyway, um, yeah, so I mean, having looked at that for a while, and then for the first time, I actually managed to take a look in some of the trenches just in around that rifle and where I could actually see the dead fossil guys lying in the trenches and things like that. So from from a moment of huge excitement, possibly two, three hours earlier was our first contact to, I mean, this must have been about 10, 11 in the morning. Um, no, no, it was a bit later. It was more like midday, one o'clock in, yeah. It was early afternoon, that's right. Suddenly, you know, I'm on this battlefield and there's dead people around me. There's one of our vehicles here burning. There's guys inside it. You know, the whole feeling changed. But needless to say, you know, I mean, as you probably know from, from experiencing this on the battlefield, you know, you, your thoughts wander, but you, it's very, very, quickly all brought back together because something will happen and suddenly you're back in your soldier mode and off you go. I think and what, what happens, happens was, sorry, I think what happens is your training, your training is just kicks in. Absolutely. And yes. You don't even realize it's kicking in, but but you've been drilled on that for however long Absolutely. it is, a year, year and a half. Um and, and particularly in the run up to that operation, it's it's quite intense. And I and yeah. I don't think you actually even think you your training just takes over and, and you do what you have to do. Absolutely. And yeah, you know, I, I, I wasn't conscious of it at the time, but you know, thinking back afterwards, that's exactly what happened. Because here I was pondering the destruction around me. And and funny enough, if I can describe the actual battlefield, it was something like not quite a World War One battlefield where, where there's no trees at all because they've all been blown away. But what really struck me was that all the trees had been chopped off at various heights. Now, there were still a lot of trees standing, but because of the amount of artillery and explosions, there were a lot of trees that had been chopped off. And that kind of intrigued me, you know. It, it, it sort of, I thought it, it was very much like a World War I battle scene, but not quite as bad. And um, yeah, so I went back to my rifle. We went and dropped the guy back off at his tank, picked up the spare guy, put him back in our rifle, and we were just driving back to where the rest of our HQ vehicles were when we suddenly got a call on the radio um, that there were MIGs in the air. Now, having been briefed and drilled about what to do when there's enemy aircraft in the air, you know, obviously we just went straight into action, bombshelled, find the nearest tree and hide under a tree. <clears throat> and I can remember this MiG, it was a MiG-23, came flying over literally not more than treetop high. But he was actually flying very slowly and banking. And I could see the pilot looking out of his cockpit to the side to actually look for targets. And I'll never forget this particular pilot had a red helmet on, so you could see it, this red dot in the cockpit as he came flying past. And I don't know, something just came over me and I thought to me, there's no way you're going to launch a long fly around here. And, and at that stage, we'd also received the order weapon three. So that means they wanted everything to shoot at these MiGs. There were two of them. So, of course, I jumped back into the rifle, grabbed my R5 rifle, hop out, and let rip. I'm standing up on the back of a rifle, shooting at a MiG with an R5 rifle. Now, in hindsight, that's an absolute exercise in futility. Because first of all, the chances of actually hitting the MiG are close to zero. And second of all, if you hit it with a 5.56 millimeter bullet, you're not going to do any damage to it. So anyway, I'll, I'll let rip on, on automatic as well, on Afrikaans, as the guys would say. And, and fired a whole magazine in, in oh, less than, uh, must be about six seconds. And, and just the, the excitement of that and the adrenaline rush sort of made me feel a bit better when I climbed back into my rifle. Um, I think what had happened though was I, I saw the MiG sort of banking around and then suddenly the a MiG-23 being a variable wing fighter, um, the wings were forward while they were slowly flying over us. And I suddenly saw these wings go back and the MiG just and disappeared. 
gone, never to be seen again. And later I realized it must have been the volume of fire from all the anti-aircraft elements that were with us, with their 20 millimeter guns and things, um, Ace of Park anti-aircraft guns firing at these guys. That obviously spooked them and they just left. And yeah, this happened, what, about three, four in the afternoon. So by then, you know, everything had wound up. It was dead quiet. And we were instructed to form up again and then move back through the through the um, battlefield, basically, back to where we came from. And then we veered off to the left, if I can remember, from our access to advance and traveled for another two or three hours before we met up with the echelon to replenish and replenish fuel, ammunition, and all the, the stuff we needed to do. Um, we did that mm -hmm. for a couple of hours. By, by then, it was about 11 o'clock at night before we finally moved off and pulled into a lager where we were to stay for the night. But um, Sorry, and in terms of that day's battle, other than the tank that had to have its track shortened, no, no damaged tanks, no losses? The okay. infantry suffered, suffered a, a, a number of people. If I can remember the stats for that day, because funny enough, being the transport NCO, it was my role to gather all the stats for the squadron. So I had to, at every replenishment point, I had to basically record every single of liter of diesel that had been filled up, um, every round of ammunition, all of that. So I had a book which I had to record all of this. And just out of interest, what I would do is also monitor the um, logistics net. And funny enough, on that net, they also announced all the casualties. And that day we had lost nine people killed in action, and it must have been about 30 odd wounded. And I remember once we were in that lager and the crews were doing their maintenance on their tanks and, and getting their tanks battle ready again, I remember walking around and talking to the guys. And one of the guys told me about a rifle that had been taken out with a 23 mil anti-aircraft gun. And he had actually seen it happen and he said the rounds just went straight through it. And it turned out that I think two guys were killed in that rifle. Um, one of them was actually sitting in the anti-aircraft gun position at the back. And he took a 23 mobile round to the head. So yeah, nothing less. But um, you know, so these were the type of stories I was picking up from the guard as I was walking around the vehicle, getting all their stats as well. And um, yeah, I can remember that night, I mean, lying next to the rifle, we basically sat under the stars the whole time in my sleeping bag and, and I remember getting into my sleeping bag and then I remember waking up the next morning. You know, it, it, it's just sheer exhaustion. Sheer exhaustion, absolutely. You know, and, and, and the term what what they call it battle fatigue comes to mind there where you just so exhausted, you're so tired and you've been running on adrenaline all day. So you've come down from that adrenaline high and you just pass out. But um, yeah, that was our first first action during Operation Modulo, which was the 9th of November, 1987. And, and Liz, and, just, a bit of, just a bit of information on the, the tanks. You used yes. Oliphant, sir? Oliphant Mark 1A. Which were yeah. basically a centurion from the Second World War, modified a little bit. Well, um, no, not quite from the Second World War. So it was a centurion Mark 5, which basically came into being Nine, early 1950s, so okay, certainly so. Korean War vintage. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and then, but and then, highly modified, not not slightly modified. Not, oh, highly okay. modified. All right. Yeah. 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 You see, we we never even saw. I mean, to us, a tank was something that was parked outside SSB or something, you know. But yeah, we never, right. we never had the, yeah. the the opportunity as as rifle or as infantry to to even look inside one of those. And and in terms yeah. of the. The crew, obviously you've got a driver, you've got a gunner, um, you have someone loading in the back. Is is that it? Three guys in that tank? Four guys. So you've Four got a, a driver, gunner, then a loader, and the crew commander. Okay. okay. So so basically in the hole. So if you can think of a tank as two parts, you've got the turret and you've got the hole. You've got at the front, at the bottom, you've got the driver sitting in 
basically with his butt almost touching the ground. Because, I mean, his seat is right up against the floor of the tank. So, I mean, he's literally inches from the ground. Um, then in the turret, you've got the, the gunner, which is towards the front on the right-hand side of the gun. Behind him, you've got the crew commander at the top of the turret. And on the left side of the turret, you've got the loader. Now, the loader's obviously got the most space because he's running around and, and he's got a lot of ammunition stowed all around him. So he's got space to actually load the gun. And then the gun itself, I, I, I don't know, but was it a 105 millimeter? 105, yeah. 105, 105. millimeter gun. And, and um, how Sort of yep. how quickly do you fire that? Um, I mean, it's it's single rounds loaded and single shots fired. Yeah. That's so it, as quickly yes. as the guy can load, then you can fire. Basically. As quickly as you can fire, yes. And I mean, with our squadron, I reckon our guys could easily pop off five, six rounds a minute. Easy. Yeah. Because they just had so much practice, having trained so much for that entire year. So. Very, very physical job, the loader, because, I mean, a round weighs upwards of 35 kilograms. So, so you uh, put you know, six of those in a minute, it's 200 kilos worth. Correct. So, I mean, you're doing a lot of CT there. So those guys were incredibly fit. And funny enough, it wasn't the big, bulky guys that were the best loaders. I mean, we had guys that were rather short, dumpy little guys that uh, were excellent but, loaders. Uh, but, but that's often the case. So, uh, I mean, I... And absolutely. Uh, about a month and a half ago, I went up to uh, the Northern Cape. I was invited by the 3 2 Recce Wing guys. Um, yes. and, and, and it's amazing how small. I mean, there was one big, really tall guy that was taller than me, and I'm, I'm quite tall. But, but for the most of them, they're, they're relatively average height and even shorter than average. And, and yeah. you sit back, these guys carried backpacks of. 60 kilos the backpack yeah. must have just not been dragging on the ground and that but but they were the guys that uh could do it you know absolutely you know just now that you mention it you know thinking about the guys i did my training with my tank training um you know your 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 typical armored soldier is not very tall um you know the shorter guys tend to make the best soldiers for armor for obvious reasons and um, particularly the armored cars i mean the elon armored cars are my new to look thing but I had guys with me that were way over six foot and, and they operated in these vehicles. Now, I'm, I'm not too tall myself. I'm only five foot nine and a half. So, I mean, I'm pretty average or below average. And I found, you know, I was, I was, I, I was comfortable in the tank, but geez, some of these six foot or more guys, I, I just no, no. I, I couldn't understand how they operated in there, but they did. Yeah, so anyway, to get back to the operation, um, that first night, um, as I said, dead to the world. <laughs> um, the next morning, we were basically told um, to get ready. Um, we would be moving off uh, early in the morning. And they basically discovered where the remnants of 16th Brigade had moved to, and we were going to go back and attack them again. And it was funny enough, we moved off about 10, 11 in the morning, and we were in a, in a line ahead convoy, so in a straight line. And once again, we were told MIGs in the air. Um, basically, the call over the radio would be all stations, Victor, Victor. That's it. And that was the, the call that came out to say MIGs in the air, or in Afrikaans, Alastasi, Victor, Victor. And um, so obviously, we did our, our usual drills, herringbone, camouflage, and the MiGs sort of flew around and then disappeared, didn't drop any bombs or anything, so clearly they didn't see us. And then, then we were told just to stand by there and um, we're not going to move because what had happened is one of the infantry guys, while jumping off a rifle, had had a, a AD with his rifle and shot himself in the stomach. So the priority now was to get that guy gathered back and, and so we just had to stand fast and we ended up sitting there for a good four or five hours. Eventually they came on the air and said to us, listen here, obviously, you know, it's too late. We're not going to carry on with the attack. We'll move into another lager and just spend the night, which we did. And um, the next morning, we were basically told, um, 
No, it was the night before. That's right. The night before we were called together and in an order group, the the um, the major told us that that we're going off um, to attack another position the next morning. And um, basically, same drill. You know, slept, woke up in the morning, prepared, made sure the vehicles were battle ready, hopped in and moved off. This time it was just before sunrise, and met up with the whole battle group and moved off. And I can just remember that day it was probably one of the most frustrating days for the first half of the day, because we would be moving off, then there would be a report, you know, enemy not fine front would move into our, 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 our battle formation, which was line abreast, basically. Rifles would move up between us and we'd start moving in these 100 meter steps through the thick bush. Needless to say, contact wasn't made. And this carried on till about two in the afternoon. And eventually we were told, okay, stop the vehicles. The vehicles were stopped in battle formation. They told us, get out of the vehicle, stretch your legs, replenish your water bottles. Now with the tanks, basically we carried the water in, in big jerry cans, which were in the bins on the outside. So the guys on the inside, once they had drunk what was in their water bottles, there was no water left. So they had to get out, get out the jerry cans, fill up their water bottles. And um, so we were doing that. And I remember I got out of the rifle and then I remember I was standing against a big tree, busy relieving myself against this tree. And then suddenly all these leaves started falling out of the tree. It was strange. And then I heard the shot. It was basically small on fire that was hitting the tree and all the leaves were raining down on me. And um, it must have been an absolute flash. From that position, I was in the top of the rifle and in my seat. Um, before I realized what was happening. And what was happening is we had basically stopped a couple of hundred meters in front of the enemy without realizing it. And when, when our guys got started getting out of the vehicles and, you know, replenishing water, food, you know, the infantry guys were filling up their water bottles from the taps on the rifle, that's when they realized, okay, he has their chance, and they opened fire on us. And, that, and they left rip with everything they had. Um, fortunately, around me was just small arms fire, but um, they did. There was some tank fire, some mortars, and and some anti-aircraft guns firing at our guys as well. And it was at that stage, you know, once I hopped into the rifle, um, we got a call from one of the tanks not far from where I was standing. Um, the crew commander had been hit, and it was basically the gunner and. No radio protocol or anything. He just came on the end and said, Major, Major, my, my crew commander's been shot in the face. Not call sign, not who he was, nothing. So we had to guess who it was. And basically from the voice, we knew exactly who it was and, and we knew which vehicle he was in. So because we had the medic in our rifle, our, our rifle basically rushed up, parked next to the tank. Um, the medic jumped out and sort of climbed on the back of the tank and had the turret in front of him protecting from incoming fire, sort of opened the hatch and, and grabbed the crew commander out by the handle on the back of his tank overall and pulled him out. And what had happened was he had little bits of shrapnel in his face and in his eye. What had happened was as he was climbing into the turret of his tank and pulling his hatch closed, an AK round had hit the edge of his hatch and broken up and those little bits had ended up in his face. So probably the luckiest guy on earth because that bullet hit a strip of metal that yeah. thick, square on and broke up. Mm -hmm. And those bits went in his face. So it needless, so obviously the guy wasn't able to carry on the fight. He was blind in one eye. So we pulled him out and um, one of our guys in my rifle, we had another corporal with us who jumped into the tank and carried on as the crew commander of that vehicle. And then we, the medic bandaged him up and we drove him back to where the medics were and handed him over. And he was basically Kazavak that night, the choppers came in and flew him back, back to Rundu and from there on, I think to one more. But to this day, he still has bits of shrapnel in his face, those that they couldn't get out. Um, he didn't lose sight of his, in his eye, so he was lucky. But I can remember seeing him at a reunion of, must have been a good 10 years after the fact, 
and you could see all these little stars. And he, he told me every now and then you'd get a pimple on his face. And if he squeezed it, a little piece of metal would pop out. So that shrapnel working its way out of his face. But anyway, so after that happened, obviously the squadron and, and everybody got organized and we started moving forward. Now, basically how we would overcome a situation like that, where we, we know the enemy's in front of us, we don't know how many there are because of the um, density of the bush, we couldn't observe them. So what we'd do is all the tanks would fire what we call a fire belt action. And I think the infantry also have something like that with their rifles, where all the rifles open fire at the same time. And basically with a fire belt action, we would fire um, probably three rounds as quickly as we could. It doesn't even matter that it's not aimed at a target or anything. You just fire three rounds in that direction. And, and that basically had the effect of suppressing the enemy for a short while so that the whole battle group could move forward. And I can remember that the bush started um, becoming less dense, so we could actually by the time we had sort of got into this less dense area, our visibility was 200 meters or more. So it was pretty open. And that's when the tanks started seeing the individual targets and taking out targets. And um, all of a sudden, one of the tanks hit a anti-tank mine. And I can just remember seeing the tank was probably about 100 meters in front of me to my left. And I can just remember seeing this huge explosion and seeing one of the bogey wheels, those wheels on the side of the tank, one of them flying up in the air. Now those things weigh 60, 70 kilos each. And that thing flew up in the air as if somebody had taken it and thrown it like, you know, like a tennis ball. And then of course the you know the 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 whole sort of advance came to a grinding halt because basically we were then ordered, hang on, we're in a minefield, stop. And I remember at that stage, a lot of the infantry, um, at that stage, they had allocated 3-2 um, battalion troops to each of our tanks. Because they were on foot and not in vehicles, they allocated us 6 3-2 battalion troops to ride on the tanks with us. And when we hit contact, they would jump up and walk between us. And at that stage, they, these guys had started moving forward from the tanks and were already into the enemy trenches and sorting them out there. So. Um, I remember our infantry started stepping out and, and doing the same. And um, I remember, I, I didn't actually see it, but uh, the lieutenant who was with me in the turret of the rifle said that he just saw an infantry guy drop. So he ordered the, the driver to move the rifle up to next to where this guy was lying. And but at that stage, once we got there, um, a medic had already got to the guy. And, and the lieutenant basically opened his hatch and stuck his head out and shouted to the medic, you know, is he okay, is he okay? And, and the medic just shook his head. So he basically said to me, listen, yeah, let's pick this guy up and take him back to the medical post, which was about, uh, I think, half a kilometer behind us. So I climbed out of the turret inside the rifle, because there was no way I was getting out, to, you know, out the front of the rifle. Got, came out the side door and we picked this guy up and um, he had been shot in the cheek. They say it was a sniper that actually hit him, hit him in the cheek here, yeah, so he was gone. So I remember three of us, the, our medic, myself and, and the medic from, from the company that was with him, picked him up and we sort of slumped him on, on the section leader's chair in the command rifle. And, and I hopped back in and we drove back to the medics and handed him over. And I later learned the guy's name and everything. And yeah, but um, that that was quite a once again quite a quite a, a a heartbreaking experience. You know, actually, you know, jumping out and here's this guy lying here, and he was a big guy. I mean, probably six foot or more. Probably weighed close to 100 kilos with his webbing and and all of these things. And and you know, trying to pick. A guy, up, it was difficult, but we got him in the rifle. And um, yeah, after we dropped him off at the medic, we then moved forward um, back to where the tanks were. And at that stage, the Tiffies, and this is the next story about the heroism of the Tiffies, the Tiffies had pulled their ARV up behind this tank that had hit the mine. 
and they were, had basically climbed out of the ARV and with a cutting torch, were busy cutting the track because it was all tangled up there, cutting the track off. And obviously the enemy had seen this and were just letting rip at, at them with small arms fire. And I, I remember seeing the, the AK rounds sort of hitting the tank and, and their ARV just pinging off the side of the vehicle. And we pulled up behind the ARV and, and we also took a couple of small arms rounds against, I mean, just hear the clang, clang, clang against the side of the rifle. And um, yeah, eventually these guys, I mean, basically under fire with a cutting torch had cut this track off, hooked up a kinetic rope to the back of the tank. Now, I don't know if you know what a kinetic rope is. It's basically a rope that stretches and then when it contracts again, you know, that's how you pull things out of the mud and stuff like that. And they'd hooked up a kinetic rope to the, the tank, attached it to the ARV. The second ARV had come in behind that one and with a tow bar had joined this little convoy and they dragged this tank out. Basically, it was on its belly on the soft sand and dragged it out, I think it was two or three kilometers to a position where the tippies could actually work on it. And they spent the whole of that night rebuilding that whole track and suspension unit. And that tank drove out of there the next morning. But um, yeah. for me, the heroism was these guys climbing out of that ARV as these rounds are pinging off the side of the vehicle with a cutting torch to basically cut off that track. And, and funny enough, Cyril, um, in his interview with Quirt, actually mentioned, you know, how he felt these guys had saved his life. He was the gunner inside that tank. And yeah, absolute heroism. But anyway, while all this was going on, um, the rest of the squadron was static at that stage. Um, you know, we couldn't move forward because of the mine. And um, we're just stuck there. And the infantry had basically cleared the trenches in front of us and, and moved back on their own tracks and got into their rifles and we were actually ordered to withdraw on our own track marks to avoid any more mines and we were told that 6-1 would come in and, and carry on the fight you know basically relieve us that we could go back replenish ammunition um, water and all the rest because bearing in mind we'd been going since oh, must be about seven eight that morning so the guys were tired, the infantry were tired having walked God knows how many of kilometers between the vehicles. Um, everybody was just finished. And I can remember we pulled back to where the, the Tiffies had found a spot in Dent Bush to actually fix this, this tank undercover. Now remember, we had just pulled into sort of a lager when suddenly Migs appeared above us. And you know, we were, I, I remember I dived under the tank they were busy fixing because this MIG was circling above us. I was convinced he's going to drop a bomb on us. So I dived underneath this tank and, you know, nothing happened. So I sort of stuck my head out and I actually saw this MIG uh, drop two bombs, which basically landed, oh, it must have been a good kilometer away from us. You know, massive explosion, but far away that, you know, oh, okay. That was the reaction the guys did. And, um, yeah, and another very interesting night because, I mean, all this tension of the day and now you sort of coming down from that adrenaline rush and, you know, I think between the 9th and this, the 11th of November, those were our two most intense battles. And I remember when I was walking around gathering all the stats from the guys, um, I determined we had, we had taken out I think it was 14 T-54 T-55 tanks on the other side of the other side tank. And um, what the guys were doing is they were actually putting stripes on their barrels for every tank that they took out. So I think the most successful gunner there, um, I think he had taken out three, three or four. So he had three or four stripes. But somebody had found a roll of masking tape. So they're putting masking tape rings on the barrel to signify the number of tanks they've taken out. So, I mean, that's just one of those things that, that typical yeah. tank soldiers will understand, but nobody else knows and what those stripes for. Yeah, sure. But, but yeah, um, very intense that day, particularly from a point of view of 
you know, you're expecting to have contact at any moment and then nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. And then when you're told to rest, then it happens. And that was kind of bizarre. But um, there, there were a couple of things on that day that were particularly, well, which I will never forget. One is while we were in that minefield dealing with the, um, with the tank that it hit the mine, I remember to the right, I must be about good three, four hundred meters away, I could see a rifle burning. And um, I basically, I think that night or sometime during the next week, I'd heard from the company who were there, it was Bravo Company of Forsyth, um, that yes, they had lost a rifle there as well, also had been shot. The, the round had entered, it, shot by a tank and the round had entered through the driver's glass of, of his, you know, his front windscreen. So they lost a couple of guys there. And then something else I learned from my own guys is that during that initial contact, when, when we were pulling the crew commander out with the shrapnel in his face, a mortar bomb had landed on the back of one of the other tanks. And there were two, three, two battalion guys on the back of that tank. and, and they were basically pulled off the tank and both died there and then, basically. So, I mean, these are stories I picked up from the guys, you know, talking to them afterwards and, and in subsequent conversations much later. Um, yeah, so it's, and, and of course, the infantry guy that I didn't actually see him get hit, but, you know, that we picked up and took back to the medical post as well. So, you know, it's all these sort of things that, that, that you remember. Um, oh, absolutely, and, and and it's amazing how fervid the memories can be. Forty years, well, in your absolutely. case, not quite forty, absolutely. but uh, 30, 36 years later, thirty-seven, thirty-seven, 37 years. years, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, there, there there's certain things that I remember like they happened yesterday, and then there's other details that I, I struggle to remember, like um, those first two. Two battles. I mean, they could have happened last week. That, that's how vividly I remember them. Yeah. Subsequent it's, stuff suddenly disappeared. Yeah, but but it's always interesting. And and I was, uh, in fact, I was on a legacy video released this morning where I was interviewed. Um, okay. So two, three, two reckies that were involved in the run up to Smoke Shell, and yes. I was interviewed from the six one point of view. And and I was just right. saying, I was just saying how little things that someone says suddenly bring a, a, a memory back that you hadn't thought of for forty years, but Absolutely. but it just triggers yeah. it just triggers a, a dormant memory. And in my case, uh, Peter Williams, who was one of the three two Reikis, was saying that if you join three two, you could bail out at any point in time and actually choose where you wanted to go to. Yes, I've, so, I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. So if you wanted to go and sit at the castle in Cape Town, you could you could literally do that. Yeah. And yeah. but but to the best of his knowledge, no one ever took that. No. Uh, that option. Okay. And I was saying, you know, it, it triggered a memory. A couple of days, sort of more or less, when they told us we were going to attack the QFL or Smoke Shell base, they had us on the parade ground, and they said. This is the this is it now. We we known it was going to happen because suddenly an extra company had arrived, the paravats had arrived, and there was this yeah. big build up, extra training and things like that. So we knew something big was going to happen. But they called us the parade ground and and something I'd forgotten about totally, but Peter mentioned that is we were then told if anyone wants to bail out, they can do so. Yeah. Decide yeah. now. And you don't have to go. And to the best of my knowledge, no one, no one did. But I mean, it's a, it's yeah. something that I'd forgotten about completely, and it got triggered by by something similar. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, no, then, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. no, obviously because of my interest in in what happened. And funny enough, um, while I was at university, I actually did a thesis on on the Cuban involvement in in Africa. So of course, a large a, a, a large part of that would have was the involvement in Angola. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, and I used um, obviously I used a lot of my own experience in writing that thesis. 
and and so, subsequently, you know, I've been very interested in 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 the whole conflict. So I've done a lot of studies and read a lot of stuff put out by various people, and basically been able to filter out what was the rubbish and what actually is true. But I think when and, you've uh, been there, I think when you've yes. been there, you it it becomes fairly easy to filter out. Yeah. Um, you know. You you almost you meet a guy somewhere and he's a recce or he was a top recce in the world yeah. and 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 you immediately know when a guy's bullshit for want of a better word. Absolutely, way. absolutely, yeah. Whereas he funny might enough, impress. I mean, he, he funny might enough, impress. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So, um, you know, you get these guys saying, "Yeah, I was a recce and I was this and I was that." Um. I met a guy, well, I, I was working for a security company in Sandton in uh, the early 90s. And we got a new operations manager. And, um, you know, I got chatting with the guy and everything. And I suddenly clicked, hang on a sec. The guy's name is Mike Bourne. There was a recce that used to come on the air quite often and warn us when the mix went in the air. And his call sign was Mike Bravo. So of course, immediately I delved into the books and everything, and, and and I did a little bit of research, and lo and behold, the guy's name is actually Mike Bourne. He was a major Mike Bourne from Five And was he from East London? Was he from East London by any chance? I don't know. Uh, no, I knew been. Mike uh, many years ago. I knew Mike Bourne. I don't, I don't know whether he was a uh, anything. No, but, no. Uh, Anyway, so obviously the next day I go to work and I say, Mike, um, was your call sign Mike Bravo? He says, yes. He says, how do you know? I said, well, I was in E Squadron Forsyth. He says, oh, were you with Andre Retief? I said, yeah. And, and we actually became good mates after that. And like you were saying earlier, I mean, he has, this guy apparently sat in a foxhole within sight of the runway at Puita Tanavale for weeks on end. And all he did was, every time a mix was off, he just got on the radio and warned us. Yeah. And um, I'm assuming guy, okay, he was, what, in his 50s or, yeah, probably in his 50s at that stage already. So, you know, elderly guy, but not a big brute. I mean, you look at him, you would never say this guy was a special forces soldier. Yeah. And yes, I mean, the guys that know will tell you stories about Mike Bourne that, yeah, will blow your mind. <laughs> the accomplishments that he's, he's achieved. What What did you actually study uh, this? I actually did international relations. Um, you know, I wanted to get involved in the diplomatic corps, joint foreign affairs. But then I, I, I also did a stream of, of IR called um, strategic studies, which is international conflict. And it's just because it appealed to me. And yeah, so I, I did a, a Bachelor of Arts degree in international relations with a focus on strategic studies. I mean, needless to say, I never got to work for the Department of Foreign Affairs, but yeah, that's what I studied. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you talk about that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I did my last camp, in fact, was February to May 88. Oh, and right, it was yeah. the whole it is the whole Peter. Yeah. And um, I mean, we never saw action as such. We, we also had the Victor Victor um, yeah. almost every day. So we'd move around, we'd sort of set up dummy um, anti aircraft uh, sites um, and basically dig foxholes. And the, we would know from when the recce, because the recce's were watching the runway. We'd know right. when the woods took off, so we'd dive into the holes and, uh, you know, they would, they would fly very high. I think they were pretty yeah. scared of our anti aircraft. And yes, uh, nothing ever harmed us, um, but we did come across a couple of hot craters that were created by the mm -hmm. thousand pounders or whatever they dropped. Yeah. Um, but my understanding then was that the moment these guys took off, the recce's would direct the, the artillery fire onto the runway and, and potholes right. in their runway that they then couldn't land, so they'd have to move further north to to actually land. Yeah, well, apparently during <coughs> sorry during, during October eighty seven, um, they were they were still taking off from Quetzalcoatl um, 
and eventually the artillery managed to damage their runway to such an extent that they stopped using Quitos and air base. So they had to come from Minong, which was 20 minutes further away. So that's 20 minutes less time over the battlefield. So, I mean, and that was all as a result of, as you said, as the wreckies watching those runways and, and calling in the artillery. But um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's strange how small the world is when, I mean, you know, we hear, hear this voice on the radio and, and, you know, you don't think about it. And then years later, you actually meet the yeah. guy. Yeah. yeah, look, I think I think certainly in current times, social social media has has done oh, has been absolutely fantastic, and I know a lot of people are anti Facebook and things like that. But yeah. but in terms of of uh, meeting up and reconnecting with your your comrades or brothers from those days, um, you know, it, to me, it's been a fantastic tool to absolutely. to be able to do that. You know, I've, I've, you know, despite being in Australia, funny enough, there's another two members of E Squadron who also live here in Australia. I'm in Canberra in the capital, and then two of my old squadron mates are down in Melbourne. And we we keep regular contact on, on Facebook and stuff like that. So, yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, in terms of, of our experiences, uh, um, you know, as I said, those first two battles were absolutely vivid. And then the subsequent days sort of became less um, less memorable for the simple reason that the, the, the contacts we did have weren't as intense as, as those first two days. And then there were days where we just spent days driving and driving and chasing Fafla and just not catching them or just catching fleeting glimpses of them and firing a couple of shots at them. And then they, you know, and, and towards the end of our, certainly our part of the campaign, it, it became very frustrating because often we would get information that they just in front of us in positions or whatever. We would move to those positions and just find rifles and webbing and kit lying there where they'd obviously just dropped everything and taken off. And um, yeah, I think we had one other sort of significant contact after that. Um, I think it was the 25th of November, um, where we were, we had basically, what had happened was, our job was to chase all the Fafla brigades over the Quito River back to Quito Ponavale. Um, and I think there was a bit of a miscalculation as to the defenses on the eastern side of the Quito River, because you had what they called the Tumpo Triangle, which was their main logistics area, just across the river um, from Quito Ponavale. And basically what had happened was the Tumpo Triangle, you've got the Quito River and you've got the Chambinga River. So they had formed a triangle within those two rivers. And um, what all the brigades did was they moved to Tumpo and from there to Quito. And I think our last sort of effort was to make sure that they were stuck in Tumpo and couldn't come back out. And then the guys that would relieve us, and eventually Ops Hooper was, was basically born from that, it was their job to then deal with them in the Tumpo Triangle. And I can just remember we had basically channeled the last remnants of, of the Papla Brigade into a small area leading up to the um, the bridge over the Chambinga River. And I can just remember that one particular day we were chasing them and, and we were in very dense bush and they were moving across the Shauna and we were shooting at them as they moved across and eventually they disappeared into the bush on the other side and obviously across the bridge. And I can just remember how our guys were saying it was the first time in Angola that they were firing shots at 500 meters or more because they were firing across one of these shawners. Now, I suppose yeah. your overseas viewers, yeah. um, you have to describe what a shawner is, but it's basically a flat pan that in the rainy season fills up with water, so it becomes a lake. But in the dry season, as this was, it's, it's just an open, flat piece of grassland, the shape of a lake. And um, I remember the gunners saying, you know, it was the first time in how many months since they'd been at Lohaka that they were actually shooting at targets at 
500 to 2,000 meters. And, um, very interesting. Um, the different techniques from, from a gunner's point of view that you would use at those ranges compared to what they were doing at 20 to 150 meters. Um, what is the what is the sort of normal range of your? Of well, your generally, all our training is done at about a thousand two hundred up to three thousand meters about the maximum. Okay, so it is a long range thing. It, it just, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Now, something I can tell you about the elephants we used is essentially the technology that we were using was was very much perfected by the Israelis. So this was was stuff that they had researched and, and put into their centurions for the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And one of the, the features of the Yom Kippur War was, was the Israeli ability to take out Syrian tanks at, at very long distances. So they concentrated on long range gunnery. And um, I think as a lesson of that, we also did a lot of long range gunnery training during our training. So, I mean, we were very used to I mean, even at Bloemfontein, at the Brug training ground outside Bloemfontein, I mean, we were shooting at 1,200 to 3,000 meters. And at Lohatla, we even got to shoot further than that, although obviously the, the gun's not designed to shoot more than 3,500 meters accurately. But yeah. So, I mean, that was another interesting feature that, that, that really stood out for me was, was that day that the guys were shooting at, at longer ranges. And, I remember one of the guys reporting over the radio that he he hit the tank and he saw the crew climbing out and he, he saying, but they white guys. And we like, yeah, okay. Turns out it was a Cuban tank. It was actually Cubans that were manning the tank. So, I mean, all he could see was they weren't black guys getting out of the tank, it was white guys. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, you know, just silly little things like that that you remember. Um, no, yeah, and I mean, you know, I think after that we had one, one or two more days where, you know, chasing these guys and, and just not catching them, finding their, their positions abandoned, and they leave everything behind, including their boots. That's something that intrigued me when they ran. They would always take off their boots. Uh, yeah. Probably you can run better in that soft sand. With, well, possibly, with and, and, and possibly less chance of leaving square. That's also that's also true. Yeah. Although I mean, it's mechanized warfare. Nobody's going to do any tracking. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But um, I think one other one other thing that happened during that that whole period was um, because of the soft sand, it, it it basically wore away the tracks on our tanks much quicker than it normally would on on harder ground. And I can remember one particular phase. We were in a lager and, and our, our tracks were stuck on our tank. Basically, they stretch. So what has happened is, if you can imagine tank tracks, is made up of blocks of steel together with a pin through it, and that's holding it together. And those pins stretch to the point that it looks like a crankshaft, not quite as you know extreme as a crankshaft, but it, that sort of concept. So what we had to do is we had to change the track pins on all of our tanks, and that took three days. So basically, all you're doing is you've got a long metal bar and a sledgehammer, and you're knocking this track pin out. And once it's half out, you put the new one in, and you knock it in to replace the old one. And that's how you replace track pins. Sounds quite simple in concept. No, no, when you try to knock out a crankshaft with a straight piece yeah. of metal, not yeah. so easy. Not so it's got sure. three days. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about 52, 104 track pins on a tank. It took us three days. And eventually, some of the 3-2 battalion troops that were riding with us on the tank were joining us. And this was their, their, their exercise for the day, knocking out track, track pins. Um, so, yeah, that was very interesting from a point of view is, you know, again, something that as Tank troops, you know, we expect, but when, when other people hear it, you know, they, they don't realize the amount of maintenance that goes into a tank. I mean, a silly example, when an infantryman finishes a fight and pulls into a lager or something, he sits down, warms up his food, has his food, climbs in his sleeping bag, oh no, cleans his rifle, 
It's like cleaning their rifle. Cleans his rifle, climbs in his sleeping bag, and goes to sleep. Well, takes about half an hour. The tank guy, once he pulls into his lager, he's got about another three hours of maintenance before he can warm up his food, eat his food, climb into his sleeping bag, and go to sleep. So, I mean, our guys were working way into the night while the infantry around us were all fast asleep. And that's just the nature of, of being a tank troop. I mean, you've got to clean the gun. You've got to tighten, um, you know, they, they, they tighten the tracks um, because the tracks stretch. Um, you've got to check the oil and stuff in the engine. You've got to replenish the ammunition. You've got to, you know, check all the, the couplings and things on your sights and things to make sure nothing's loose because, you know, if your sight isn't working properly, you're not going to shoot straight. Things like that. So, hell of a lot of maintenance that used to take place after a battle. So, yeah, very interesting. Okay, then, then you, the end of '87, you finished your national service. Yeah. So essentially, after that, basically, uh, when was it? Must have been close to the first of December. 30th of November, 1st of December, somewhere around there. We were actually um, been on on operations that day. Once again, chasing enemy, you know, taking artillery fire, but not seeing them, and you know, frustrating day. And towards the end of the day, the order suddenly came: right, boys, form up in a in a in a um, line of uh, what do you call it? Uh, not line of rest. A, a column, and we moved back to Mavinga from close to Quito Cuanavale in one night. So, I mean, at that stage, it was 60 odd Ks or something. I think we arrived back at Mavinga at just before sunlight the next morning, slept the whole of the next day, and, and stayed there for a, I think it was over a week. And then we were suddenly relieved by F Squadron from School of Armor, which were the, the national servicemen from the year after us who came to relieve yeah. us. And then we were flown back to Rundu, hopped in trucks and drove back over the border to uh, Deerhans Camp, what's it, a recreation camp or whatever they call it. Just That's inside a transit, of the, transit camp. Transit camp. Okay. Yeah. Transit. Um, spent a week there, then drove back over the border, back to Rundu, and then hopped on the, the Flossies, Hercules, and flew back to Bloemfontein. And I can remember landing in Bloemfontein had a day to sort of what we call clear out, clear out, hand back all my kit, sign everything that needed to be signed, you know, anything that was broken, just signed their operational loss and was written off. And basically cleared out of the army two days after I'd been in Angola in Wazir City. Yeah. It was unreal. I mean, I can remember the guys at, at the School of Armour that hadn't come with us from our year wait that I think it was another five days to clear out. We were basically flown back, cleared out, gone, there you go. So, I mean, I cleared out on the 13th of December 1987, and we were supposed to stay on, I think it was till the 21st or the 20th, when, well, the rest of my mates cleared out that day. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that, that was our, our involvement in Operation Modular. I mean, after that, I was, um, I was um, posted to Pretoria Regiment, which is a citizen force regiment in Pretoria, tank regiment. And um, I remember we got certificates when we cleared out saying that we would not be called up for two years as, as, as a, basically a gift from, from the army for our involvement in Operation Modular. Funny enough, I think I, my first week in January, I got called up of Hooper with Pretoria Regiment. And I just sent in a copy of that certificate saying, no, sorry, guys. <laughs> I've just come from there. I'm not going back now. For sure. And yeah, that's when I went to university. So during my university years, I did a couple of camps with Pretoria Regiment um, during university holidays and things like that. I did a couple of courses. And then in 94, when everything changed in the country, obviously national service and, and um, citizen force yeah. camps were stopped. So I stopped, you know, I, I wasn't called up, so I stopped. 
Um, that was in 94. And then in 98, I went to a reunion at the School of Armour. And there were a whole bunch of my mates there who were with Pretoria Regiment. And they twisted my rubber arm. And I basically went back to Pretoria Regiment, rejoined the regiment. And I finally got my discharge from the regiment on the 28th of November, 2011. Uh, 2011. Um, 28th of February 2011, a week before I came to Australia. So I did I did a total of 18 years at Pretoria Regiment and, and two years at School of Armour. So that was my 20 year service. No, oh, that's that's great. It's, yeah, so um, yeah, maybe we should call it a day then. Uh, yeah. Well, I suppose yeah. Um, yeah, Liz, it's been great chatting to you. Thanks a lot. Uh, very, very informative. And and for the legacy viewers out there, um, I'm sure you would have enjoyed this one. Um, it's it's an area that you don't often see much of. You know, these legacy videos tend to be six one, three two, three keys, a couple of parabats. Um, so so it's interesting to get from another area. Um, yeah, and, and so legacy viewers, until we meet again, thank you.